Welcome to Concepts of Programming Languages with Professor Califf. Today I'd like to talk about function activation records. What these are is they're the function specific data that we need when the function is actually running. It does need to persist until the function is completely finished, even when another function that it called is running. So while we're waiting for that function to finish, we still do need to hang on to this data. So what does that consist of? First of all, we need a return address. So we need to know where we're going to go back when this function is finished. And that could be a lot of different places. So think about a function like the print line in Java or any standard print, whatever programming language you're thinking of. That gets called in a lot of different places and we have to make sure it goes back to the right place when it's finished. We also have to worry about parameter storage. We need to store any local variables that this function might have. And we need to have a place for the return value if we are returning a value to the function that called us. The order of these things will vary among languages and among implementations of a given language. In general, this is what we need to make sure that we have for every subroutine that we're managing. The first approach to function activation records that we might want to consider is the static approach. This was taken with some of the older languages. In that case, each function in a program has exactly one activation record. The memory for those is allocated when the program starts. So we just set up all of the different spaces for all of the different functions. They have their memory. And then a function call only requires filling in the values for the things that uh, we get at that point. So the parameters, return address, but we don't have to do anything about the rest of it. One language that worked this way was some of our older Fortran versions. And there are some advantages here. First of all, it's going to be a little bit faster at runtime because it has less to do when we have a call to a function. All of the function memory has been allocated at load time before we actually started running. Also has very predictable memory use. So we have the space for all the different functions and what they need. We're not going to need more or less during the run. And of course, it's a little simpler to implement because we just set everything up when we start the program and use it as we go. However, there are some drawbacks. We might be using more memory than we need. We don't usually have all of those functions running at once. And so we have to have space for all these things when we may only use a few of them. And some of them we may not even use at all during some particular run of the program. We can also only have one activation of any given function at once, which means we can't have recursion. And while I'm sure that some of my students are going, oh, yay, no recursion. The reality is that recursion is a really useful thing. Not having that available to us limits some of our ability to solve complex problems. Most modern languages use dynamic function activation records instead. We're going to allocate the record when the function is called. We can have as many copies as we need for a given function. You may have heard of this concept as the stack or the call stack. So how do we actually implement the stack? We're going to start at one end of the program's memory, and then we're going to push and pop records as we do with other stacks. So whenever we call a function, we're going to put its function activation record on the stack. Whenever we're done with a function, when it completes, we're going to pop that record off. This is similar in some ways to implementing a stack with an array because we are using contiguous memory typically. However, we do need a pointer to the previous activation record. The reason for that is that our record size is going to vary depending on the specifics of each function. Because each function activation record has the specific amount of data needed for this function's parameters, local variables, etc. We don't want all of our function activation records to have to be big enough to hold all the data that is needed by the largest one. So instead, we're simply going to deal with the fact that the record sizes vary. So now I want to walk through an example. I have a very simple C++ program here. And so we're going to look at what's going on with the stack. 
we have a pointer to the current activation record. We always need to keep track of where the top of our stack is. So we're going to start, of course, with main and set up its activation record. It does have a return address because it's going to return to somewhere. Whether or not it really has a previous activation record may depend on specifics of implementation. So now we're going to start stepping into that program. We had a space for the value in our record. Now we're going to give the value the two. And then we need to call another function, this add five function. So that's going to put a new record on our stack, which is now the current activation record. And that activation record is going to point back to main. The return address here is going to be the location in the code for main that will get us to actually do the assignment of whatever this returns into that value. And then result and return value are set up. The return value is whatever we're going to return. That is separate from whatever variable or whatever that could be, because that could be a constant or something, but we have a place for the thing we're returning in addition to any local variables. So then we start moving through add five. Of course, that makes result have the value seven. Then we're going to return the result. So we're going to put seven into that return value. And that's going to get passed back as we shift back to main. And this activation record goes away. So now we're back to just main on the stack. Now, most likely we didn't actually do anything about that other data. It's still there on the stack but we're now willing to overwrite it and reuse that memory space. So now we store that value into the variable value and we call print with five with that variable. So then this is going to set up the activation record for print with five, which is a little different from the activation record for add five. So we get the parameter. Of course, the return address now will be pointing to the end of main and the previous activation record is main. And then we have the space for num2, though it doesn't have a value yet. So now the first thing that print with five does is it calls this add five function. So we're going to put that activation record on our stack with that parameter value seven. Return address is gonna take us to where this value gets stored into num2. And of course the previous activation record this time will be the print with five activation record. Now we can move on through add five and do that work just like we did before. And then we're going to return back to print with five, passing back that 12, getting stored in number two. Then as we move on, we see that we have some operators here. We don't know a lot about what's going on inside that because we don't have that code. But there's going to be a function activation record that corresponds to that insertion operator. And it's going to have a couple of parameters, one of which represents the left hand side of that operator, which will be a reference to the cout object. And one of them will be the num2 we're trying to print. Then we're going to have a return address, which will get us back to where we're ready to do the second insertion operator there. The previous activation record, of course, is the one for print with five. And the return value is waiting, of course. We do have a return value because we know that operator returns the stream after it's done the writing to it. And so as we do the writing, it will then do the return and we'll be back and do the next call with that second insertion operator which will be inserting into the stream that was returned by the first one. So we have the cout object again. The right hand side is the end of line that we're printing. And the same thing will happen. It will do its work. It will return the resulting stream object. And then we will go back to the end of print with five, which then will be a return back to the other anytime we hit the end of a function without hitting a return we're going to then return back and we end up back with main. That gives you a little bit of a sense of what is actually happening in the computer as we're calling our functions. Now there are some other complications. So this is sort of the basic thing 
This is all that is needed for some of our modern languages. However, some of them allow us to do some more complicated kinds of things. One of those is nested function definitions. So sometimes we can put definitions for functions inside other functions, and that can cause us some extra work in our function activation records. We also sometimes pass functions as parameters, which can create some extra complications. And finally, sometimes we need for functions to stick around after they should be finished in order for other subroutines to have access to the data that those functions had. In those cases, we can't manage our memory in quite the same way as we're used to thinking of it, because we have to make sure that that function sticks around somewhere until we're done with it. I want to talk a little bit more about the nested function case and what's going on there. So suppose I have a function in a language where I can put functions inside of other functions. So this outer function can call either of the inner functions. And inner function 2 could also call the first inner function. One thing to consider is that if outer function has data, both inner function 1 and inner function 2 are allowed to access the data that belongs to the outer function. And of course, that will be specific to that particular call to outer function that then ended up calling one of the inner functions. Now, as long as it's a direct call, that's not a problem for us because if outer function calls inner function one, inner function one has a pointer back to outer function, and we can just use that pointer to go get to the data that's in the outer function. But sometimes these are recursive. The inner function one may call itself and that may call itself. And yet each of those may need to access the data from the outer function activation record. In addition, we could call things indirectly. So suppose outer function calls inner function two, and then inner function two calls inner function one. Inner function one is supposed to have access to outer functions data. So how we handle that is to have another pointer which is often referred to as a nesting link. So whenever we're setting things up with these nested functions, we need to also be able to set up this link to the most recent activation record, the relevant activation record of the enclosing function. Thank you for watching. I hope that you now feel like you have a little bit better understanding of function activation records and what they're used for why we would want to do them dynamically, and I hope to see you next time.